Oh, I'm going to see these people before. I've never seen them. Yeah. This, did, did you, did you hear the introduction? This was supposed to be when Lee Hamilton introduced us that this had been set up by young people on the staff. I'm delighted to convene this the second panel. <coughs> Well, at, where the first was designed to focus upon uh, operations on the ground and uh, deepen our understanding of civil military relations relations in the field. Uh, this panel is going to be devoted more to, to lessons learned and to the policy implications of what has been t taking place on the ground. We have three very distinguished panelists with us today, uh, all of whom I think I've worked with in one fashion or another at different capacities over the years. Um, I am delighted to, to welcome, um, uh, I'll just uh, introduce them briefly and then we'll go in the sequence in which you have them listed in your program, uh, to ask them to make 10 minute remarks if you would and to allow maximum time for, for a question and answers from the audience. Um, Colonel John Agoglia is Director of the U.S. Army Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute. Uh, he has had a very distinguished career, uh, recently served for three years at the U.S. Central Command, uh, helping to develop the organization's plans for Afghanistan and for the global war on terror. He was also part of the initial planning group that initiated the campaign plan for Iraq. In May of 2003, he served as CENTCOM liaison officer uh, to U.S. Civil Ambassador in Iraq, Paul Bremer. Um, the, uh, more recently, he was asked to direct the U.S. Army's Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute at the U.S. Army War College. Um, Julia Taft, um, uh, holding down an interim position as President and CEO of Interaction, was most recently the Assistant Administrator and Director of the Bureau for Crisis Prevention and Recovery in the UNDP. Um, in January 2002, she headed the UNDP Task Force, co coordinating a, a single a coherent recovery effort f for Afghanistan, and she can probably identify with that term coordination, um, in support of the work of the special representative of the U uh, UN Secretary General for Afghanistan. Um, prior to joining the UNDP, uh, Julia served as Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Population, <coughs> Refugees and Migration at the U.S. State Department. That was the period in which I was privileged to work with her. Uh, she's also been Director of the, o U of the Office for U.S. Disaster Assistance in USAID, and U.S. Special Coordinator for Tibetan Affairs in the U.S. Department of State. Uh, Bob Perito, Senior Program Officer uh, for Post-Conflict Peace and Stability Operations at the U.S. Institute for Peace, uh, was a career Foreign Service Officer with the Department of State for, for many years. <coughs> Before joining the Institute for Peace, he served as Deputy Director of the International Criminal Investigative Training Assistance Program at the U.S. Department of Justice. And in that role was responsible for providing, providing policy guidance and pro program direction for peacekeeping operations in, in diverse locations from Haiti and Bosnia to <coughs> East Timor and Kosovo, as well as in post-conflict environments in Albania, Croatia, and Macedonia. Um, delighted to welcome all three of you to the panel, and we look forward to your remarks. Uh, Colonel, would you like to begin? Thank you very much, Howard. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of build upon the comments that the practitioners put before us uh, this morning and talk about some policy things. Um, one thing that struck me as they were talking, as the audience was asking questions, we can all come up with good examples of what our organizations have done. We can all come up with bad examples, or others can come up with bad examples of what our organizations have done. Um, but, but that's not the point. The point is what's the normative behavior of our organization? And how is that normative behavior improving? Is it improving towards the point where most people seem to be more effective, or is it improving to where people are seeing it being less effective? And again, the arguments of, I saw this good thing happen, I saw that, really, 
why nice to hear are irrelevant if it's not the norm, if it's not institutionalized into the organization, and it becomes a learning organization that's continued to build upon the good lessons and shed the bad ones. And I don't think we're there as a U.S. government. I don't think we're there as a U.S. military. I don't think we're there as a U.S. Army. I think we're trying to go that way, but damn, we got a lot of room to, for improvement, and we got a long way to go in terms of getting there. Um, a lot of focus about making better soldiers. You know, I hear that all the time. I'm, I'm an infantryman. I hear what infantry guys do well. I hear what infantry guys don't do well. I'm a strategic planner as well. A lot of discussion out there about how do we make better soldiers. Really what we need is a lot of discussion how about how we make better policy. Because I think Linda's example, she might have missed the boat just a little bit on this, where she talked about the transition between that soft unit and that conventional unit. I would dare to say it wasn't because of a di disparity in skills between that soft unit and the conventional unit. Why that existed, I would dare to say the challenge was the failure to have adequate policy and then the policies that overturned the good work that the special forces units did now put that conventional force in a box that was hard to recover from. And on top of it, their lack of the specialized skills made it even harder to matter the ma uh, manage the chaos after the ignorance of the policy decisions that overturned the good work they had set in place. So again, policy is so critical, and if you don't have the right policy, I don't care how skilled you are as a soldier, as a diplomat, you're still going to be ineffective. So why we need to make better soldiers, better policy make, I mean better diplomats, better aid workers, we really need to focus in on the number one thing that they need is coherent, culturally attuned, situationally aware policy guidance and recommendations that they can then act on. And that is something we're not quite giving to them. Um, intellectual clarity is absolutely essential because without the intellectual clarity, you can't then have the right physical change. Physical change without the intellectual clarity is just change for change's sake that kind of looks good, but you know, it's irrelevant because it doesn't accomplish the effect you're trying to accomplish. And we don't have the intellectual clarity in our government, we don't have the intellectual clarity in the international community as to what it means to deal with the challenges we're facing right now. Um, <clears throat> and what do I mean by intellectual clarity? What's, what is the difference between counterinsurgency, irregular warfare, stability operations, post-conflict operations, m military operations other than war? What it, I mean, my God. I, I'm so confused by the number of terms I got to try to define, I can't even get into the argument because I can't even learn the definitions of all the terms that everybody's using. Um, so, so we need to have that intellectual clarity, and the only way we're going to get that intellectual clarity in my mind is to have some sort of strategic framework. W what is the effect that we as a U.S. government are trying to achieve? And it is we as a U.S. government, not we as a U.S. military, not we as a U.S. diplomat, we as a U.S. government. What are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to achieve as a reflection of the values of our country, as a reflection of what we would like the world to look like? And that's one thing, as a country, we have put out there, I believe, and we have the example in the history to show that we're a country that's put ourselves on the line to shape the world, to make it a better place. Yeah, make it in our image, we think that's a better place. I got that. But still, we're not an imperialistic country. We're not, a we're not a country that colonializes the world. We tr do try to help. We may do it in misbegotten fashions. We may do it in misguided ways. We may make mistakes, and we've certainly done that. But what are the core values that are driving us? And then what's that strategic framework that we need to develop? Um, but while we're having that, that, that discussion, there are certain things out there that we look at and go, how come we don't have that intellectual clarity? And I think one of them Roy Williams hit on is our failure to put in place the mechanisms necessary to collaborate and to share information and to talk to one another in an effective fashion. How do we do that as U.S. policy makers? How do we effectively talk to one another? How do we ensure our policy makers have the right information? I think there's some pragmatic things we can do to get at that, and I'll talk to those in a second. But before that, I'd like to get to another myth, the myth that we can work it out on the ground. There is no doubt that practitioners on the ground can wing it in the, light, in, the lack, uh, in the light of a lack of clear, coherent policy guidance and make things happen that are good. But just as often, they're making things happen that are bad because they don't understand the second and third order consequences because no one's done the thinking for them 
that establishes the right and left limits and gives them clarity of guidance so they can maneuver within it. So why we are good, and I've been in that position on the field winging it with the lack of guidance and trying to make good things happen and pretty proud about the good things that you made happen, and then you start reading about the bad things that happened that you never even anticipated, you weren't even aware of. Those, the person who said, how can we learn that lesson about the right interpreters? You know, how can you not understand that? Well, when you're in the pressure of the situation trying to demonstrate results, trying to, not demonstrate, but trying to achieve results and fix some tough situations, it's very easy to forget about that little simple principle and make sure that you have balanced interpreters from across the tribes. Or if you don't have the information to understand that and you think you're doing it, you think you have interpreters who are balanced mm. and you realize, oops, I don't have them. Okay, so it's very easy in the, in the crucible of the challenge to make some bad choices out there. But again, working it out on the ground, while we're very proud of that, is, very, is a good thing that we want. But it'd be a hell of a lot more effective if when we were working out on the ground, we were within the boundaries of culturally attuned, situationally aware, pragmatic policy guidance that gave us the right and left limits that had anticipated the second and third order effects and had gotten us attuned to understanding the second and third order effects on the ground rather than doing discovery learning where we may or may not understand that second and third order effect and we may or may not be effective <clears throat> or cause further damage. Um, misdiagnosis of the problem. We talked about Somalia. I thought Linda hit a key point there. Misdiagnosis of Somalia. I think she's right on. Roy's admission that, yeah, that, you know, we looked at it as a humanitarian disaster. We went in there. And as a military force, we went in there, uh, humanitarian disaster is what it means. And we found ourselves now dealing with the technicals and dealing with a different threat that we were not prepared for from a policy perspective. And as a result, made poor policy choices because we misdiagnosed it. But it seems to be the norm that we continue to misdiagnose, not the exception. <clears throat> and that goes back to what are some pragmatic things we can do to prevent us from doing the misdiagnosis. And why is it? that we're doing the misdiagnosis. Uh, from the perspective of, of, we look at it from diplomatic information, military and economic elements of power, there's no doubt that this country is a military and economic juggernaut. But those are capabilities that are things you want to possess, but that's not a strategy mm. for achieving the effect you want to achieve in the international community. Diplomacy is the piece that does that, and we seem to be diplomatic apprentices rather than practiced diplomatic mm. tradesmen. And I'm not pointing a finger at the State Department. I'm pointing a finger at every one of us who's in the U.S. government, because at some point in time, we all have a part to play as a diplomat for the United States government. And we don't do it very well because we don't talk to one another. The military talking to the state, the state talking to the military, talking mm. with commerce, sharing with aid, mm. understanding the capabilities and the limitations of each of our organizations and understanding how we as a country team, how we as a regional team can work together, we don't seem to do that very well. And we don't seem to have the information that's coming in to feed us to make sure that we're culturally attuned and situationally aware. And it's, I often hear the, the, the information debate about we need to get better information to the commanders on the ground. I would tell you the commanders on the ground would much rather have culturally attuned, situationally aware policy guidance than intelligence about the bad guys. They'll figure out the intelligence about the bad guys. Trust me, they're the guys getting shot at. We're the guys getting dodging the bombs. We'll sort that out. But if you give me the policy guidance that makes sense, that has anticipated the second and third order effects, I can be a much better coordinator, administrator, commander on the ground. And I'd much rather have that. And I think it's not intelligence that we need for the guys on the ground. It's information that's processed and analyzed that allows us to provide policy options. And it's needed back here in D.C. Because the policy options, the strategy and the policy guidance has to come from D.C. It doesn't come from Casey and, and, and Khalilzad in Iraq. It doesn't come from Newman and Eikenberry in Afghanistan. While they need to inform the process and have a, have a vote in the process, it needs to be coming out of here from D.C. It needs to be coherent. And I, often at times, we don't quite have that intellectual clarity and that coherency in our strategic approach. And as a result, hmm, we have a problem with policy. But how do we get that informational clarity across the USG? Who in the United States government is responsible for gathering all the information that is available across all the departments of the United States government that can lead to an informed 
culturally tuned assessment of the situation in particular regions. I don't know who that is. It's certainly not the National Intelligence Agency because they seem to focus on intelligence, which is on bad guys and blowing stuff up, versus the information we're talking about that we need, which is the cultural awareness, the understanding of the economic indicators and factors, the, economic, the understanding of the social indications, the understanding of the public security and private security issues of the population. Those are things we need to know, and that's not about who the bad guys are. That's about how does the society function, how does the society interact, what are the challenges with it, and therefore then what are the options available to the policymakers that we can put out there and to keep multiple options open so that mm -hmm. when we get on the ground, we can start to identify, is this a policy option that we can continue to keep open and continue to advance? Or do we need to start to change lanes and adjust? But again, we can adjust the policy guidance on the ground because it's, it's anticipated that second and third order effect. But that lack of information just doesn't, you know, it doesn't help us. And there's no system in place right now back in D.C. for doing that. That's my supposition. I could be wrong. But that to me would be the first step in this is a strategic framework that really articulates how we are going to approach this current situation, this current security environment we find ourselves in from a whole of government approach, and then how are we going to develop the information that's necessary to support the development of situationally aware, culturally attuned policy guidance to our commanders in the field. And then the next piece is then how do we develop the civil military relationships, the civil military teams necessary to effectively implement the United States government, the coalition, the international community's strategies for improving the situation in these places that are under distress. Those to me are three key things we can look at, and we can start working on those right now. And that to me is what we need to get in terms of lessons learned. How do we get at those three things? The framework, the common operating picture, and the civil military teams. And you can't have a flexible civil military team if you don't have a coherent guidance coherent policy guidance that allows you to adjust the composition makeup, the chain of command, the level of unity of effort without understanding what it is you're trying to do. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you <coughs> very much. <coughs> Julia. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. I understand that Lee Hamilton said that this was organized by young people so they can hear fresh voices. Well, my voice is very old. I have been in this field for over 30 years and um, have, uh, I guess I've been invited because I have worn many different hats um, in my career. And I am to talk to you a little bit about uh, the lessons that have been learned from wearing those different hats. Let me start with, with 1975. Some of you probably weren't even born in 1975, but it was a very important year because it was the year that Vietnam fell. And uh, for decades, the civilian and military cooperation has been excellent. And I think part of it was based on the experience that we had working together uh, in 1975. Uh, I was the, the dreaded coordinator of the uh, reception and, re and resettlement of 130,000 refugees at the time. Um, and what was quite interesting is uh, I operated out of the <clears throat> State Department, uh, and Congress appropriated the money to manage the reception and resettlement to the State Department. Um, we used that money and that power to establish policies established civilian management over each of the camps, and we had four major camps in the United States. We had camps in Guam and Wake Island and Utapau uh, in Thailand. But we had the money in the State Department to reimburse the Defense Department for every action we asked them to undertake. And they were fabulous. They organized the, uh, the airlifts, uh, bringing the refugees in. They um, managed camp facilities. Uh, they brought in every chef, practically, from the UN military, uh, the U.S. military, to uh, cook food, make nukmam, etc. Uh, they provided perimeter security, and they, in fact, did these services on behalf of the State Department. We reimbursed them, and two lessons I learned is: whoever's got the money has the power and sets the policy. 
And number two, no coordinator should try to coordinate without any money. Where's Doug Stafford? Um, that was 1975, and the military, they were so good. We even uh, got the Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Defense to establish a humanitarian service award for every military that had been engaged more than 30 days. That still is being uh, done. My two greatest godfathers, other than President Ford, were Dick Cheney, and Don Rumsfeld, but they were operating first as uh, chiefs of staff uh, to, the, to Ford and then uh, uh, Rummy went over to the Defense Department. I say this because they both understood the importance at that time of a civilian-led initiative and the State Department being the preeminent Stucky of all this. Now, uh, let me skip to 1983. Um, I was appointed by Secretary Weinberger to develop a plan for military <clears throat> assistance in humanitarian programs and training exercises. Um, one of our focuses was in Latin America where the military were doing a number of training exercises and they would go in and want to do community action, which was fine. Uh, but they would start immunization programs and they would put in wells and they would do all kinds of things totally separate from whatever the US, USAID program was or what the, the government itself had wanted. But this was, these were nice efforts. The problem was none of them was sustainable. When they put in a well, they had to take out the piping after the exercise was over so they could not leave a fixed asset in a country. That is not development. On immunization, they would do one round of, of immunization and there was no follow-up for perhaps the second or third. So this was chaos. So we organized a different way of doing this and got uh, changes in the legislation and a formal office established uh, called the Office for Humanitarian Affairs and it was in OSD and dear Bob Waltheus was the first director of that. That was just great. Um, later, uh, I was the director of OFTA. And I must say, the military, again, did everything we asked them to do, whether it was airlift, stockpiles, uh, Army Corps of Engineers stuff, uh, whatever. But USAID paid for it. So you could ask them and task them, not tell them how to do it, but what you wanted done. And as a result, the military partnership was effective, swift, and politically neutral. Now, where we got into some issues on neutrality, I think, uh, but it worked okay, was in 1991 in northern Iraq after Gulf War I. Uh, the military was there, the, uh, particularly the Army, uh, and while they were not designated an occupying par uh, power, they were in fact running northern Iraq at the time. Uh, the military was led by dear Jay Garner, General Jay Garner, uh, and he worked alongside the UN and the NGOs in a very good partnership. And let me tell you what was particularly interesting about this. He recognized that he didn't know anything about refugees and that the military didn't know anything about refugees. They didn't know anything about Kurdish uh, culture. Uh, they weren't quite sure what to do with issues of women and children and all of that. And so he relied first on the NGOs to tell him, what do I need to do? What can you guys do? And what do I need to do to help you do what you need to do? And uh, our dear um, uh, hero, Fred Cuny, was part of his group that helped uh, design the siting of the camps, what kind of food, what sort of social services, how to deal with landmines, et cetera. And they provided essential assistance on transportation. And this is something we often ask the military to do. Uh, uh, Bill Garvelink and I were out there together. Uh, and it was working really well. And I, I'd like to just say one thing that a, uh, a key general out there, the person who was representing um, civil affairs, he said, I said, you know, you all, you're spoiling us. You're, you know, making sure we have right tents and you're feeding us, et cetera, and you're asking for our opinion and you're doing what we ask you to do. Why is that? And he said, this is General Campbell, he said, the effectiveness of what you NGOs do and the UN does will be our ticket home. In other words, the capability that exists 
and strengthen on the civilian <laughs> side is the best way to get our military to be able to go home. I think we don't always remember that. Uh, well, I mean, the military knows it, but, <laughs> but, <love> we, <laughs> but when you think about it, the, one of the questions is, are we in fact building that capacity? Or are we supplanting that capacity by asking the military to take on more and more responsibility rather than ensuring that the civilian agencies have those capacity? Um, I, I won't go in too much on, on the issue of Afghanistan and the stabilization programs. You talked about the PRTs earlier. They have been extremely controversial. Uh, and um, the NGOs that I now represent have had some very difficult uh, uh, relations with the military, particularly because um, of the sort of dual role of the military, trying to look like, be like NGOs at the same time they also are engaged in combat. And, and again, um, uh, our sense is that uh, we have long valued our role of impartiality and mm -hmm and neutrality, and that involving military in PRT concepts is a politicization of it and is blurring the roles uh, on humanitarian space. And it's very difficult for the affected communities to know who the good guys are. Uh, and there are good military guys, and there are good NGO guys, but they ought to be doing different things, and they ought to be perceived as doing separate things, and we believe the NGO uh, role here has not been um, uh, sufficiently clarified. Um, as a result of what has happened in Afghanistan and, and some of the tensions in civil military relationships, the UN through the Interagency Standing Committee has spent a lot of time working with the militaries and, and amongst the members and uh, has come up with uh, the relationship of CivMil in uh, complex emergencies. I will make sure that uh, the organizers have the reference material. This summarizes exactly what the angst is between the humanitarian community and the military community and identifies ways to go forward so th that there can be coexistence. It's a very important uh, document. Um, now, how do we deal with the tensions? Um, there have been a number of processes, as I, uh, as I mentioned, about trying to talk with the military and deal with the military, and we've had a particularly interaction, and the NGOs have had a lot of success. When I was CEO and president 10 years ago, tell me if I've come full circle, uh, we would do seminars with the military. We'd do joint exercises at Fort Polk and Emerald Express. Uh, we got them to uh, change their trade doc, uh, their, their training doctrine. Um, they funded interaction to actually prepare a video and a DVD that could be circulated all throughout the military establishment about what's unique about NGOs. You know, we don't have chains of command and we don't have a lot of things that the military is used to. Uh, but this explaining what humanitarian space is and what the contributions of NGOs are. Uh, that dialogue has, has uh, been very useful, and I think the military certainly understand now that NGOs do not want to be called force multipliers. <laughs> they do not want to wear guns. They do not want to be embedded in military activities. Um, but there are some things that the NGOs are very uh, willing to do uh, in terms of liaison with humanitarian operations centers, information exchange. Um, uh, and, and anything that will ensure that the NGOs have operational independence and can do their humanitarian imperatives. Now, we're developing guidelines, and our board is meeting on this uh, next week to ensure that we are speaking with one voice for the NGOs, but it is not, uh, it is not a lack of willingness to continue our very productive uh, discussions. Now, the question always comes up uh, in post-conflict situations, and this was particularly true uh, or apparent to me when I started working at the UN uh, Development Program, um, to try to figure out what do militaries do best and what do civilians do best. And I think that one of the uh, things that, that uh, would be very helpful for us to focus on is clarity and agreement somehow on what it is that militaries do do best in a post-conflict situation. And I've just identified uh, five ideas uh, or, or sectors, and I think each of those 
uh, would merit a discussion and a real confirmation, uh, particularly by our military as to, and, and other peacekeepers, but our military in a post-conflict where we have been a combatant or we are an occupying power, what can they do? Number one is security, security, security. Number two is vital infrastructure of restarting the electric grids, the water uh, communications. In other words, building the uh, framework for others, particularly civilians, to be able to function. Number three, uh, demobilization um, and disarmament. I think the military is, is best placed, but of course the reintegration has to be done by uh, NGOs and the UN. Uh, fourth, the military could be very helpful indirectly uh, with the money that flows into uh, any post-conflict situation that the military is engaged in is to ensure that the domestic workforce benefits. Mm -hmm. You've got to get people to think and feel that their life is better in a post-conflict and they all need to have jobs, they need to have a lot of things. But, but in looking at what happened in Iraq, where a number of those contracts went to Gulf countries who then didn't have the workforces to do the work, they went to Pakistan and Sri Lanka and other places to get workers to go into Iraq. Well, this is a problem. There are a lot of people in Iraq who, who needed jobs. And so I think that, that more thought and assistance in how you match up uh, the investment of, of funding by DOD to make sure that the economy benefits would be great. And finally, uh, to su support the joint planning of civilian agencies. The military has incredible planning capacities in the way they think, in the way they organize information, uh, and the way they, they can help others function. And while I don't recommend that the military is best at organizing justice, police, corrections, transitional governance structures or social uh, revitalization. Um, I think their skills in, in planning should be more available and, and assisting uh, the civilians. Now what do civilians offer? I haven't heard anything yet much about the United Nations. And I guess I didn't really know how wonderful the UN could be if it were well targeted and focused, but I sure learned in Afghanistan about how effective the UN can be, particularly in negotiating with the local officials, the transitional authorities. They had people and have people on the ground who know about Afghanistan, who have Afghan employees, who understood the context. So the best understanding of the culture, the actors, and the political framework you will find in the civilian sector, whether it's the UN agencies and UNICEF and the rest of them, or whether it's in the NGOs, the international NGOs, who often have worked in these places before, during, and after a conflict. That's where your information comes from. Secondly, the UN and civilian agencies do have knowledge on different options that are essential for post-conflict reconstruction. They have volumes on variations of constitutional formats. They have the linguists that you need to have. They, they know and have been doing elections. They know how to develop justice systems and transitional justice. They can train uh, the military, and they certainly know about social services. So these civilian agencies, and it's not just the UN, uh, but, but there's a lot of information out there uh, that, that often is not embraced when the US thinks it's in charge. Uh, a couple of other things um, about uh, the civilian agencies, the joint needs assessments that have been done uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Haiti, Liberia, those are the four that I was most heavily engaged in, pulled together the UN, the World Bank, the international donors, the NGOs, and local authorities to figure out what needs to be done and what's the sequence of how to do it. And what in that process is some of the very important information that, that others need to have about the sequencing uh, and the assets that need to be rebuilt. Fourth, um, civilians are really rooted in the civil society. They employ the civil society, they're at the community level often, they understand the culture. There is nothing you can learn real fast about these cultures, and, and we're talking about a real depth of understanding that it would be almost impossible for uh, external actors to be able to pick up very quickly. Um, 
civilians can also mo mobilize broad-based support and international burden sharing. And this is a real key issue, I think, for the United States, is how much do we own these problems and how much is it our responsibility to solve these problems, when in fact there are a whole panoply of, of partners out there that want to be helpful and they don't have mm -hmm. access to how to do that. Um, and I think civilians understand it takes a really long time to rebuild after a conflict. Uh, and unfortunately, the military has been pulled many different directions, and politicians are pulled many different directions and get sent off to do other things. And yet, you have to have a long-term perspective and commitment. And the people who do that and have that are typically the civilians. Now, uh, I, uh, in closing, I have Im important lessons learned, and they're very easy. Number one, whichever agency has the money, decides the policy and program. Number two, the historic nostalgia in the military for the days of General MacArthur in Japan are over. The world is different, and yet I think there are some who still feel that the military can do soup to nuts. It cannot. Number three, there are many competent institutions as resources who have um, uh, who are essential to the success, and, and again, they are the UN agencies, the NGOs, the bilateral uh, civilian agencies. Number four, the CSIS post-conflict uh, reconstruction study and the mapping system that they developed, I think is the best thing I've ever seen on what has to happen in post-conflict, and I don't know if Rick is still here, but uh, he inherited all that, and, and CSIS did an enormous job. It was followed up very well by Carlos Pascual on the, in the office of the Coordinator for, for Reconstruction and Stabilization. That is the key. If that office had the money that it needs, it could coordinate not only the money for initial action, but to be the funnel through which other elements of response, including the military, are funneled. That's how you make that office function, and that's how you keep a diplomatic uh, civilian role in here. I know, I know, just a couple of minutes. Uh, the military is always best at military functions and it, it, it knows it's not as good in some of the civilian functions. I think it is a problem when we try to invest more federal money to make the military be soup to nuts. They could learn it and do it. That's not the, that's not what we're talking about. The question is, what can the military do best and what can civilian agencies do best and, and be disciplined and Congress needs to be disciplined to fund those agencies that can do it. It is ludicrous to think that DOD has an extra $200 million or something and maybe they'll loan some to the State Department or they'll give them some money. What are we talking about? This is crazy. Or to try to put NGOs in a subcontractual relationship with the military. This is not, you don't do this. You have to figure out how you're going to civilianize this and you put the resources there. Uh, and in spite of all these directives and, and new initiatives that everybody has, at the end of the day, we don't own these countries and they're not our countries. It's the people of these countries that we have to support. And we have to support them in a variety of ways. And it's not just through a military lens or a diplomatic lens. It's the people-to-people -people lens. It's building the institutions because at the end of the day, it will only succeed if they are closely involved and they own the process. If they don't have the money and they don't have the involvement, it will never work. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for bringing back so, so, no, thank you for so many wonderful memories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of those discussions of why can't we just get that money from the Pentagon. Uh, <laughs> Bob. Uh, good morning. I'm Bob Perito from the United States Institute of Peace. It's always a dangerous position to be the last on the panel, and particularly when you're between Julia Taft at a lunch. Uh, uh, I've been wondering how we would uh, draw all this together, and I think the genius of the people that put this together may, may come uh, may become apparent here, but um, what I'd like to do is, is focus um, on provincial reconstruction teams. Um, this is an institution that exists 
Um, it's an institution which brings together civil military relations, relationships between the civilian and military side of our government with NGOs, the United Nations, our allies, and it, these are functioning entities. Uh, they're an example of what we've all talked about trying to do. You've heard a lot of discussion about these. Uh, what I'd like to do is take you through a kind of nuts and bolts description. Um, about a year ago, the United States Institute of Peace set out to do a study of PRTs to find out what PRTs actually do. And we talked to about 100 people that had served in PRTs, and the result of that was a, a report which is on the USIP website with the catchy title of the United States Experience with Provincial Reconstruction Teams in Afghanistan, Lessons Identified. Um, what we learned was that, first of all, PRTs are small, joint, civil-military organizations whose missions are to promote good governance, security, and reconstruction. And as you all know, PRTs have been identified now as a model for use in other countries, and particularly in Iraq. As of the 1st of May of this year, there were 23 PRTs in Afghanistan, not yet one for every province. 14 of them were run by the coalition, and nine of them were run by the NATO-led International Security Assistance Force, or ISAF. So this is a multilateral program. This multilateral program has been characterized by flexibility, a proliferation of national models, and an ad hoc approach to security and development. Now, on the good side, this has allowed for an adaptation of local to local conditions, but it has also led to a kind of confusing and indeed bewildering uh, proliferation of models, organizational structures, and, and modes of operation. PRTs act in accordance with the directives of individual governments uh, and with those individual governments' approaches to security and development. And there are national caveats which further restrict the activities of these governments. And there are some famous ones. There's one country's military which can't operate at night. There's another famous case where a country's military had to ask the United States military to come and remove a bomb from the road in front of their front gate so they could come out because their caveat, their national government had restricted them from not doing anything that was dangerous and so on. <laughs> There is a PRT executive committee which meets in Kabul and is chaired by the Afghan Minister of the Interior. It has um, U.S. generals and, and representatives from the international agencies and, and donor governments on it, but it has no authority to set policy. Uh, there is no generally agreed concept of operations for PRTs, and that leaves local commanders and local conditions to determine what PRTs actually do. Civil military relations are different in every PRT, and there's a lack of agreed measures of effectiveness, so it's very difficult to determine whether PRTs are doing a good job or not. There is, however, a U.S. model, and so what we decided when we did our study was to look at the U.S. model because that's sort of most relevant to us. In the U.S. model, a PRT has some 83 personnel, 80 military, three civilians. It's commanded by a U.S. Army lieutenant colonel, except that was in the past. Now the U.S. Army is running short of lieutenant colonels. And so the current group that's going out is, has a large number of U.S. Naval personnel of equivalent rank and U.S. Air Force personnel of equivalent rank. So it's going to be interesting, uh, as one Army colonel said, you know, what these ship drivers are going to do when they get out there in the middle of the mountains of Afghanistan. But there we go. <laughs> the civilian component to a U.S. Um, PRT is composed of a single representative, usually from the Department of State, USAID, and the Department of Agriculture. There are two U.S. Army civil affairs teams, four soldiers each. These are largely reservists who are in six-month-a-year rotations. The first team, the so-called civil affairs team, CAT-A, its job is to go outside the wire and do reconstruction and development. The CAT-B team runs the CMOC, the Civil Military Organization Committee. Its job is to stay inside the wire and coordinate with the UN and NGOs. There's a, there's a military police unit, three MPs, also reservists, whose job is to work with the local Afghan cops. There are intelligence team, there's an intelligence team, again, two or three guys, a demining group, two or three guys, a psychological operations group, again, two or three guys, and a single Afghan a colonel from the Ministry of the Interior who's the liaison officer. 
Now, that being said, that's the model. Not all US PRTs, and in fact, most PRTs don't have all of these moving parts. And indeed, lack of um, sufficient staffing and, and skills has been a major impediment to the program. Within the PRTs, the US military commander is in charge. Civilians work for him. The civilians are dependent upon the military because the military provides all the resources, logistics, administration, etc. The civil military parts of PRTs are expected to, f to form up and work as a team. There are no um, job descriptions or, or concepts or operations. Everybody's supposed to arrive on the ground and, and get along. Sometimes it takes teams larger, longer to gel than others. But to look at the civilian components, let's do that just very quickly. The State Department staffs its um, positions with foreign service officers. These people serve as the political advisor to the military commander, the political advisor to the government, to the governor, and they also do a significant amount of the reporting that's done out of Afghanistan. Fifty percent of the embassies reporting back to Washington on political and military affairs are generated by the guys that work in PRTs. U.S. aid has a representative in every P American PRT. These people serve as key members of what's called the Project Review Committee. They monitor <coughs> assistance programs, and they work directly with the civil affairs groups, the NGOs, and the UN development. The problem is, as we heard before, that after the Cold War, USAID was drawn down. There are only about 1,000 foreign service officers in UID, USAID now, maybe 1,100. And so USAID did not have career personnel to throw at these missions, and so the people that are serving in PRTs are largely uh, contractors. Uh, only about 5% of the AID budget in Afghanistan for development goes through PRTs. Most of the aid officials who work in PRTs are not contract officers, they're not CTOs, so they can't actually go out and, and supervise the projects around them. They go out and look and then they report back to somebody in Kabul or Washington who actually has the supervisory authority. And then there's the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which has made a phenomenal effort to put people in the field, the only other agency that's tried. What USAID has done is just issue a call for volunteers. I, I'm sorry, USDA has done is just issue a call for volunteers to all of its constituent agencies. And what's come is a group of people with very diverse skills who change every six months. So sometimes you have a large animal uh, veterinarian, and sometimes you have a plant pathologist, and sometimes you have a nutritionist. And um, <laughs> these people arrive. They have, of course, no training, no funding, and no program support. But, you know, they're all creative and very courageous people, and they've, you know, made a contribution. To look at the PRT mission, the PRT mission, as we've heard before, is to do three things. Extend the authority of the central government, improve security, promote reconstruction. Now, how does this work out? If you ask U.S. PRT commanders, they'll tell you that, that extending the authority of the central government is their primary mission. And on the ground, what this has meant is support your local governor and try to work with a local <laughs> governor because the local governor is appointed from Kabul. The fact is, in Afghanistan, the local governor is also generally a, uh, what the military calls a regional influential. <laughs> <laughs> and very often, these regional influentials have their own agendas, which have nothing to do with the central government. Sometimes they're corrupt, sometimes they're simply incompetent. And so the, the PRT commanders are left with a quandary <laughs> sometime about, you know, how do we carry out this part of the mandate? PRTs have made a gallant effort to reach out to locals to get to know people in the community. There's one famous, uh, there's one PRT commander who famously invited 100 mullahs to lunch. Anyway. Security is the second part of the, of the PRT mission. And indeed, PRTs do provide a security presence. The frequent sighting of U.S. military patrols in an area makes people, gives people a sense of security and keeps things calm. The work that PRTs have done with Afghan security forces has made the situation better. The problem is that, in fact, <coughs> PRTs are really responsible only for their own security. When trouble comes, PRTs withdraw inside the gate, lock the door. The reason for this is the military unit inside the PRT is generally only an infantry, infantry platoon from the U.S. National Guard. 
and its primary job is force protection and providing escorts for the military commander and the civilians when they go, quote, outside the wire. So the question I had when I went out to Afghanistan and went out to PRTs was, you know, if this is, you know, Fort Apache on the, on the frontier, how do these small little units survive? And the way they survive is they're generally surrounded by very effective U.S. combat units. Uh, the one in Gandahar before it changed over, for example, was surrounded by a, a, special, forces a special forces unit, a Marine um, battalion, uh, a group of helicopter gunships, et cetera, which kept things very peaceful. The problem is that the PRT commander doesn't coordinate the activities of all these units. Now, in places where the PRT commander was experienced, had good relations with everybody else, he could convene a meeting of his military counterparts and they would deconflict operations. In other places, however, the, the combatant commanders, the combat commanders, would either ignore the PRT or worse, there have been instances when the soldiers who served in the combat units would actually look down on the National Guard troops and the PRTs and tell them to their face, you know, you guys aren't real soldiers. The fact that PRTs have such a restricted security mandate means that they really have had very little to do in terms of providing security assistance to NGOs and IOs. In Reconstruction, PRTs do two things. They do short-term village improvement uh, projects, and these are done by the CAT teams to try to improve the situation but also make people more willing to have this foreign military presence around. And through USAID, they do longer-term development. Now, we've heard what happened when U.S. Army civil affairs teams begin to interact in Afghanistan. There was this huge blowback on the part of NGOs. That, I think, has been largely resolved now. But the problem, the problem still arises in the fact that you have people going out who are trying to do quick impact projects in areas where there is either conflict going on or areas that are very distant from home base. And so you have a situation where the CAT teams go out, hire a local contractor, turn over money, maybe material, and then drop back. The problem is then that nobody goes out to supervise and who knows what happens. And very often the result is buildings don't get finished or if they do get finished, they're not in very good shape and they fall down or you have schools without teachers or clinics without doctors, et cetera. What's happening now in Afghanistan is a transition. The U.S. is handing off the PRT program to ISAF and NATO. Um, <coughs> this has happened in the north and the west. Fortunately, those areas were relatively stable. The countries that came in to take over those PRTs have been engaged in very classic peacekeeping style operations. Now the handoff is occurring in the south. The south is conflicted. And so the Canadians have moved into Gandahar, the British have moved in. And the question now is what will happen in areas where the U.S. military will have to operate with ISAF? The question is also what happens to the U.S. civilian components that were in those PRTs? The Canadians have been very gracious. They've invited the state and the aid guys to hang on. But as Having talked, I was in Canada and Ottawa a couple of weeks ago and talking to the Canadians there, and they said nobody from the State Department has come and ta talked to them about an agreement whereby you know, these U.S. people could stay there. So what happens in that context uh, when the U.S. military departs and leaves the civilians there with a continuing mission? I want to make just three points in the one minute I have left about what we learned out of all of this. The first thing we learned out of all of this was that U.S. civilian agencies have no capacity to surge personnel in a post-conflict environment, even in a circumstance where you have, you know, an extremely important national mission to perform. The fact is that the State Department has never been able to fill all of its billets, even by relying on retirees and junior officers. AID uses contractors. USDA has had to call for volunteers. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that these operations are really not a game for amateurs. And we have operated by sending people out with no training, very little orientation, and expecting people to learn on the ground. Um, 
a couple of months ago, maybe a month ago, the first training program for PRT commanders was held in Washington. This program has been in existence and running since 2002. They just had the first training program for PRT commanders in Washington this year. Um, civilian agencies need to A, make this a priority, B, recruit people would have the requisite area expertise, language skills, et cetera, provide these people with adequate training, and then support them administratively so that the U.S. military isn't completely isn't completely responsible for providing transport, logistics support, et cetera. And the third thing is that, you know, what we've heard today is that the U.S. military has finally agreed in Iraq to provide security for these operations in, in Iraq. Um, the question arises in Afghanistan and, and in Iraq as well. What happens when the U.S. military begins to draw down and withdraw? And what is the security uh, what is the answer to the security situation of these, of these very critical civilian elements? Um, if somebody asked me a question in the, in the uh, question period about what, how this has worked out in Iraq, I'm prepared to answer that because that was the postscript on my, my, my remarks here. But um, <laughs> I think I'll let this go at this point. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Bob, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating account. Um, Okay, let's open it up for the about 15 minutes of questions that we have. Um, right in the back there on the side. We'll, we'll take about three questions and group them together. Is that okay? Thank you for your astute and acute observations. I'm Brian Murphy. I spent uh, some 14 months in Iraq. And Ms. Taft, I could give you a metaphorical hug. <laughs> I worked alongside worthy military, but often they were young Army or Marine captains tasked with impossible goals. Without a clue how to handle them, I, I was senior executive service level and I kept being ordered around by these well-meaning but uh, uh, wrong on point young men and women. The senior officers really acquitted themselves very well indeed, the lieutenant colonels, colonels. But I just want to echo what you said. Uh, it is so very, very important that the military, who are very good at many things, realize and hand off responsibilities for some of the civil affairs works that they have been doing and not doing very well. I should caveat that by saying out in the regions where I was in Iraq, I was so impressed with those same captains in their dealings with provincial level sheikhs and so forth. But uh, we have a lot of learning to do and we're learning by doing and that's not the way to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, up here and front, two, two, two questions on the side here. Um, first of all, I want to commend Once, uh, you. Microphone, please. Oh. And could you identify yourself, please? My name is Rajai Haki. I'm with the uh, Education for Peace in Iraq Center. Um, I'm also a former Iraq vet, or current Iraq vet, whatever, however you uh, interpret that. Um, first, I want to commend the speakers on, on their insightful observations on the, on the current situation. Um, clearly, I mean, you've all done your homework. Um, Thanks. Especially for the colonel, I want to say, um, I want to ask, do you think that perhaps there are ideological or cultural underpinnings that lead to the angst you describe between civil and military? And if so, how can we overcome them and so that effective coherence, liaison, and coordination can occur between all sides? I'm sorry, that was Mrs. Taft. Thank you. Uh, and right behind. Hello, uh, Henry Ryan, Institute for Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown. I just, again, on, on the PRTs, wanted to um, ask about the structure that they will have. I understand there are four in Iraq now, 16 planned. Uh, and under the, the aegis, as I understand it, of the State Department, not of the military. And I just lo would like to know if I'm correct in that. Thank you. So if we had only two questions, let's take one more in the back there. Yep. Dane Smith, American University. Uh, Colonel Agoglia has talked about the importance of uh, a coherent, culturally attuned policy guidance. Uh, I'm curious about what you think about the role of the national security strategy uh, in taking a look at, at uh, this particular mix of uh, civil and military issues. Is that too high a level of generality, or what role can it play uh, in this uh, very important issue that we're looking at? Thank you. Colonel, you want to? Okay. Um, <coughs> huh. 
I'm going to start with the last question first and work my way back. Um, the NSS is a good start, but there's a failure to take the NSS to its logical conclusion. It's conceptual only. It's not practical and pragmatic. It's not translated into action. Um, how do you take the words, the concepts, and translate it into something that's actionable, measurable, identifiable? And, and I don't see that in place. How do we set up in our government the sharing of information between the departments so that when we approach this from a long-term trend and pattern analysis and have a common operating picture of the challenges in front of us, so then when it comes time to react to a crisis, first of all, hopefully we've been doing something, damn it, to prevent the crisis, okay, in a synchronized fashion, which doesn't seem to be the case. We seem to sit down and watch a lot of crises develop, and we don't do a very good job of integrating our activities to prevent the crisis, but how can we do a better job based on the NSS of integrating our activities to first prevent the crisis. If we're unable to prevent the crisis, then how do we integrate our planning to be much more responsive and culturally attuned and effective to the crisis? And then how do we then use that knowledge to further build an effective post-conflict planning piece? And we're not there yet as a government. So while the NSS is a good start, I haven't seen then the intellectual and physical, uh, the intellectual clarity and the physical change necessary to really translate that into effective actions. And, for example, I'll just, if, if we were there, why do we have 33, I think it's 33 or 35 ministry support teams in Iraq, about 23 or so in Afghanistan, 29 PRTs potentially working in Afghanistan, we're looking at developing 18 PRTs in Iraq, and we still don't have a coherent strategy for how we train and prepare the ministry support teams or the PRT members. And the PRT model is exactly, it's a perfect example of what I talked about, folks in the field trying to wing it and get it right, because I know the guys who put the plan together for PRTs. It started out as government support teams in Iraq, transitioned to PRTs, and it was based on studying history, but it was done in the field by folks because it didn't come out of our bureaucracy back here in D.C., and now we're trying to sit here and we're critiquing it because they missed a lot of things. Well, yeah, no, no garbage. They missed a lot of things. Okay. Um, where's the whole of government approach to that, that piece? State Department moving out and being in charge of the PRTs in Iraq is a good thing. And maybe there's ownership across the interagency. That's a good thing. But we're still not there yet. We still don't have a comprehensive approach to training, preparing our folks in those missions. Final piece is on the ideological underpinnings between the failure to coordinate between the military and the civil side. I, I don't know that it's ideological underpinnings. We've been doing it across our history. I think it comes down to bureaucratic <laughs> rice bowls. It comes down to bipartisan politics. It comes down to a lack of intellectual clarity and national consensus as to what is our strategy as a country. I don't think we have had an effective, whether it's been Republican, Democratic, I don't think we've had an effective national security strategy post-Cold War, and I think we're paying the, the, the penalty for that as we just careen from one crisis to another and keep on telling ourselves, hey, we're only going to do this once, so don't worry about it. We're only going to do this once, so don't worry about it. We've done Haiti six times, but we're only going to do it once. Uh, we've done Panama, we've done Kosovo, we've done Bosnia, and now we're doing Iraq and Afghanistan, but we're not going to do it again. And we're still hearing that. So, uh, so I think that's what the challenge is, as a lack of intellectual clarity, a lack of understanding of what is our national strategic interest and a failure to articulate that to our public. And you can't ask Congress to make the change because it has to be us, the bureaucrats within the U.S. government, who have to lead the change, put it out there, and Congress will support it. But we can't ask Congress to mandate it until we present them with a comprehensive solution set. I don't think we can ask Congress to be the leaders in that. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. So, <clears throat> Julia. Um, thank you for what you just said, John. I, I, you're right about about the, the the policy framework. I'd just like to say that that um, we are selling ourselves short by thinking that it's our responsibility to solve all these problems. Now, I get back to the United Nations. Uh, the UN is an incredible um, uh, uh, framework for mobilizing things in the interest of the U.S. I mean, we practically own it. I mean, we are so influential there, it, and they're dying for leadership. They're dying for ideas. They're mm -hmm. dying for inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. And I must say that there is a cultural or psychological barrier 
coming out of the U.S. sometimes, uh, to think of them as a partner. Now, I would, I would suggest in this issue of the PRTs, I mean, what business does the U.S. military have in extending the authority of local governors, providing security only to themselves but not to the countryside, and doing short-term village improvement? There are a lot of other agencies that could do that, and nobody's really mentioned UNAMA, which is the UN uh, presence there, and the authorities and funding and structures of the UN Development Program that can do a lot of stuff and other agencies. I think we just need to have a, a real um, closed room discussion with the key actors to say, show me what you can do, and show me what you need to be able to do it better, and make sure we match resources to uh, a potential or existing talent. Now, the only other thing I'd like to say is um, uh, on the civilian cadres, um, the military can surge and they can get the best talent and the reservists are fabulous and they have every kind of talent you can expect. The civilians did have that in um, uh, for, the, for the FEMA, uh, reservist Corps. I used to be part of it and I never got invited to anything so I guess they didn't think I knew about disasters. But um, <laughs> but we could. We could and this is something that the State Department through Carlos Pascual was trying to do is to say who out there knows about judges? Uh, who knows about constitutions? Who knows, how, who knows languages? Etc. We could if we were to invest the money really come up with the best agronomists whether they're you know, if we need them uh, from USDA or Forest Service or whatever, uh, and have these people on call and brought in for training. There's no reason the military should be the only one that has a reservist corps. So again, that gets to the question of how willing are we to make an investment to use all the talent of the U.S. and do it in partnership with the other U.N. agencies and NGOs. The NGOs um, have incredible technical capacity but they can't be asked to build big roads and to do electric grids, et cetera. You have to have some very skilled people for that. But I think the key here is going to be building a civilian cadre of entrained and involved uh, reservists who are deployable and who are funded by the civilians. Um, well, let, me, uh, let me just provide you with a little background on what PRTs look like in Iraq because they look absolutely different than they look in Afghanistan. <clears throat> and one has the feeling that the only thing that made the transition was the name. Um, in Iraq and Afghanistan, PRTs are, you know, 80 soldiers and three civilians. In, in Iraq, it's uh, a very different mix. It's almost all civilian with a few military. The leader of the PRTs in Iraq are supposed to be senior, very senior uh, State Department Foreign Service officers. Um, they include a rule of law co coordinator from the Department of Justice. They include an aid officer. They include an engineer. Uh, they do include one civil affairs team. They include uh, a team of contractors from something called RTI, Research Triangle Institute, and it's the job of these contractors to go out and do um, local governance. And then they um, rely either on contract security forces or on the U.S. military to take care of them. Um, the first four of these were created, and this is sort of an open secret, by simply changing the name of what were called regional embassy offices to PRTs. And then the process has sort of stalled. And the reason it stalled, as we've heard before, is because it's very difficult for the State Department to recruit personnel, and also because there's been this argument with the military about who's responsible for security. Um, just to put a footnote on, on something Julia said, um, the Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stability in the State Department has started to move ahead on this idea of creating a civilian reserve. And they have a proposal to, to call up 3,000 Americans from around the country that would be a mix of police, uh, civil administrators, um, public um, service experts and rule of law people, judges, lawyers, corrections people. Um, this whole thing was supposed to kick off in FY07 and uh, with the, the, the standing up of the first group of these people, and this was contingent on Congress providing $25 million for the FY07 budget cycle and the House appropriators just zeroed that out. Uh, so you can tell sort of where we are. 
Thank you. Um, incidentally, the IASC conference report that Julia referenced earlier uh, will be available at the end of the program outside that's being reproduced uh, for, for people. Uh, and we're going to have our last question from the overflow room. Uh, Phil uh, Stefan uh, of USAID asked if the panelists would comment on the DOD Directive 3000.05 <laughs> that elevates preparations for reconstruction and stabilization operations to the same level as combat operations. What are the practical and policy implications for military and civilian cooperation and the division of labor? <laughs> I want to go first, I guess. Question. Okay. Um, <coughs> it, it's a great first step, but it's a first step. Uh, the good part of it, I think, is the fact that it calls for developing the civil military teams necessary to ensure that we can implement <coughs> the strategy in a more integrated, uh, holistic fashion uh, in, a, in a conflict area. Um, I do not agree with the language that says we need to be prepared to do it if the civilians can't, in the sense that while that there's some truth mm -hmm. to that, we can never expect that we can do it all. And Julia Taft said it all, soup to nuts, we can't do it. We don't have the capabilities. We don't have the skill sets. We can try. We're very damn adaptable. Uh, what uh, Julia listed, the things the military is good at, I really didn't agree with any of those other than the planning. Um, <laughs> and, and no, because they're not our tasks. They're a USG task of which we have a piece of it. Every one of the things she listed is a U.S. government task of which we have a piece for it. And that's why the civil military team is so important. And everything you listed is what the civilians do so well. I, again, I don't agree with that either. I think, again, <laughs> it's got to be the combination of the civil military element in a team that brings to bear the best of the U.S. government in how we approach these situations. And that's the thing I like about the DOD 3000 is, one, the increased emphasis on it, but the focus on developing that civil military team so that we can be a more effective player in this and, and achieve effects that are not just military, not just civilian. Because to me, that's irrelevant. You go back to Roy Williams said, and you go back to what you said, Julia, we got to look through the eye of the behold of the people we're helping. And they give a damn whether it comes from a guy in uniform or not a guy in uniform. What they care about, have we overall improved their situation? And that's what we need to focus in on. And we need to stop talking about DOD money and DOS money, because again, I all thought we were part of the same government. So the civil military team is a key component of that. And we, we are just now starting to do this survey of capabilities, uh, the survey of processes within DOD, and identifying where we need to improve those, and then we can start moving forward after that point to the discussion with the interagency about how we can support them, how we need their support in certain key areas, and how do we build that civil military bonding and team so we can be more effective. But let me let me just <laughs> add something onto this, and and so you don't walk away thinking this is going to be easy. Uh, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> please. Ain't nothing easy. First of all, I, my expertise lies in, in police and the role of police in peace <coughs> operations. And, and um, having gone to these things you know, for the last 10 years, I was stunned when the Defense Department actually did this because you know, 10 years ago, the US military wanted no part of peace operations, and especially policing. And I was just at a conference, which was actually held in Canada, where joint, which was uh, chaired by Joint Forces Command, and the whole idea was Joint Forces Command wanted to know how police and military forces could work together. And um, there's a fact here you have to know, and that is that while military forces are, are designed to kill people and break things, as one colonel said, police, their motto is preserve and protect. And um, the first slide was put up on the screen. It said, what can police do for the U.S. military? And a colonel stood up and he said in just this way, I'm going to Fallujah and I want to know what police can bring to the fight. And every police officer in that room went white. <laughs> so this is not going to be simple to bridge these cultural <laughs> gaps. A lot of work. Of work. I think that says it all. That's a, uh, what, what, a wonderful way, what a wonderful way to close a, a remarkable panel. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs> First of all, I, I want to begin my closing remarks by just simply thanking uh, the panelists, and not uh, both that have just preceded and those that appeared this morning. I think we've heard uh, some considerable wisdom I particularly welcome the, the candor and the frankness uh, of the critiques that were involved. I think for any of us who have been involved in policy or the implementation of policy, 
so much of what was stated by way of critique uh, really resonated, whether it was fuzzy guidelines, whether it was the institutional barriers, the, the stovepiping that takes place, the, everyone's desire for more integrated, uh, holistic strategies, uh, for a more clear definition of roles, of proper sequencing, and the like, and the need to create new mechanisms to collaborate and to try to fashion these more holistic strategies. Uh, in a sense, what if you look kind of break through all of that, I mean, one of the things that is really take all those elements in combination, what's really being advanced is, is, is a new paradigm for how we ought to go about the work of post-conflict reconstruction. And I just want to just share an anecdote that has absolutely nothing to do with substance, but I love it because it, a, a graphic illustration of what paradigm shift is all about. Uh, I had a congressional staff member of mine that uh, lived next door to a uh, family that kept a white rabbit in a cage. And uh, one day, uh, this uh, staff member's dog, a big Great Dane, walked into his bedroom carrying this white rabbit in his mouth. And, and he took the rabbit out of the dog's mouth, and it was very, very dead. And, and he um, felt terrible. He didn't quite know what to do, so he cleaned up this rabbit and then wandered across and put it back in the cage. And then the next-door neighbor went back home. And, <laughs> A couple hours later, there's this hideous scream, and he really felt very guilty. So he went over next door, and he said, I just heard this terrible scream. Is, is there anything I can do to help? And she looked at him and said, you know, last week, our rabbit died, and we buried it in the backyard, <laughs> and it's back. <laughs> but I really think a, a paradigm shift uh, that dramatic uh, is... <laughs> is required, and I, I thought I would, like, what I'd like to do in, in my closing remarks is, is offer a, a somewhat an or, uh, an orthodox set of reflections, perhaps, based upon um, both what you've heard today and, and also based upon my own experience uh, as a diplomat for five years, uh, but then more recently in, in post-conflict work that we've been undertaking in Congo, in Democratic Republic of the Congo, in Burundi, and in Liberia. I've been struck as through all of these experiences by the way we tend to become so preoccupied with our own institutional requirements and challenges, whether it's coordination, whether it's <coughs> communication, what have you, that I think we are often diverted, our attention is often diverted from what I think should be at the center of our consideration, which is the country that we are trying to be of assistance to. Um, I think there's a need for a country-centric paradigm that begins with the country as the f initial frame of reference, not with our institutional requirements as our frame of reference. Um, I, I'm remind my favorite saying in all this work in diplomacy and politics is that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, we have tended to ignore the importance of the mindsets of the leaders of the post-conflict societies with which we are engaging. We have adopted a very sectoral specific approach based upon our own institutional arrangements, our own understandings about what, how a democratic society works, our own bureaucratic imperatives. It has all been very nicely charted out in organizational uh, charts, uh, laid out very schematically. And I frankly think that much of that is sort of beyond the point or beside the point. Um, from my, from my perspective, working in these post-conflict situations, um, the fundamental challenge is to transform the mind, is to have the mindsets of the leaders involved in the conflicts transformed so that they begin to, to, to transform away from the conflict mentality uh, with which they have emerged. What is that mentality? Well, people come out of these conflicts believing that they're involved in a zero-sum, winner-take-all game. They may have signed a peace agreement that is the basis for our external intervention, but that does not mean that the day after they've signed the agreement that all of the trust, the mis suspicions, um, the paranoia as between the parties has been altered. But we sort of kind of just ignore that. We don't deal with the mindsets of the leaders themselves. Instead, we come up with uh, our prescription about here's how you set up a, a, a rule of law, uh, the new judiciary. Here's how you set up an independent electoral commission. Here's how we provide security sector reform. And we go about the task as if what's in the heads of the leaders of these societies is somehow beyond our reach. That's the first challenge, is transforming among the leaders of these societies 
the, the zero-sum mentality to one in which there is a recognition of interdependence, that they are tied together even with their former belligerents. Uh, because I, I do not believe that peace in any society, Iran, Afghanistan, Congo, Liberia, Burundi, is going to be sustainable until mm. such time as people begin to understand collaboration with others, not as a matter of abstract value, of inclusivity or democracy or what have you, but as a matter of enlightened self-interest, that they can be stronger, they can be more secure through that collaboration. If they don't get that, if they don't see it as a matter of self-interest, everything we are doing, I think, lacks uh, attraction, lacks sustainability. Secondly, one of the a second characteristic of all of these societies into which we are entering is that trust and relationships have broken down among all of the key players. And unless you can find some way to rebuild that trust, to rebuild those relationships so people have some confidence that the agreements that are being struck are going to be adhered to, again, nothing is sustainable. And the environment in which external actors are working remains extraordinarily volatile and dangerous because of that. Uh, thirdly, uh, there's no agreement on the rules of the game. You've got to rebuild a consensus on the rules of the game. How should power be organized and shared? How should decisions be made? Who should be at the table? Um, and finally, people in wartime and in conflict scream a lot at each other, but they've really lost the ability to communicate. And so somehow you've got to find, figure out, develop a process, I would argue, that gets the leaders themselves involved in strengthening their communications and negotiating skills so that the way they talk to one another facilitates agreement, facilitates cooperation rather than just more confrontation. Um, and that leads to my third point, which is that I think that the fundamental problems are one of process, process not ones of substance. Um, because you cannot <laughs> teach people that it is in their self-interest it doesn't work. You cannot stand <coughs> up and tell people, gee, don't you understand you're not being a good Democrat or that you shouldn't be violating human rights. The problem in these societies is not that people don't understand uh, the, the intellectual proposition about it's not a nice thing to abuse people physically. The, rather, the fundamental issue is people don't feel connected to one another. They literally have dehumanized each other. And I would argue that you cannot get at that set of issues, which is not so much intellectual and cognitive as it is emotional, social psychological set of issues, uh, simply by the kinds of training we normally do, which is, tends to be very didactic, to use a lot of lecture materials and to kind of lay out these are the principles of good governance and what have you. I think we've got to rethink the process by which we engage the countries and the leaders of the societies into which we intervene. Uh, and I, you know, we, we know what needs to be done. We can all give that litany. But unless people understand it as their own, as a matter of self-interest, it's not going to work. I learned this one example where we did the wrong thing and learned from our experience was in Burundi, where we were providing, we were asked to provide training for the newly constituted uh, high command of the national police force. Well, we knew nothing about policing. We, the trainers that, with whom I work we know something about process, about how to build collaborative <coughs> capacity, but we don't know anything about policing. So we asked uh, the uh, United Nations uh, military uh, the police uh, unit, uh, uh, CIVPOL, within Burundi, if they would serve as our technical people joining our training team. So they provided six uh, uh, police technicians to work with us. Well, they came to their very first group of 35 officers that we were training up, with their agenda, these were the issues that they wanted to tackle. And they had them all laid out. And we, our, our instinct was, gee, I'm not so sure you, you, you ought to do that, but we didn't want to be too confrontational with the United Nations Command with whom we were trying to build a partnership. So we said, OK, OK. It was an absolute disaster. First of all, the first three days of the training that we do, we don't talk about the issues, but it is an effort to build cohesion to give people negotiating, communicating skills, to, to really build some collaborative capacity. These uh, experts did not participate in that training at all. They turned up for the last two or three days of the work when we turned to substance. What were the challenges to overcome in building a new unified national professional police force? Um, and that's where they laid out their agenda. Well, they were so patronizing, unintentionally, and so insensitive to the 
uh, perceptions of, the, of their hosts that I ended up playing the role of mediator rather than facilitator between the United Nations and, and the Burundian National Police. The second time we did this with another group of 35 police command officers, the United Nations missions to its credit adopted a very different attitude. And when they arrived, we agreed that, look, this time, first of all, all six officers were going to, of, the, the, of their technical team, would actually take the training with the police command. Uh, so the, through the first three days of this process, they were simply participants in the training. Well, by the end of those three days, they had emerged as one unit with a degree of cohesiveness, of ease of relationship that was qu quite stunning. And then when we turned to substance, instead of giving the Burundians the agenda, we invited, uh, we did what we normally do, which is we asked the Burundians, okay, you've got these new skills and tools for making decisions collaboratively and, and the like. What are the issues that you see as the challenges facing you in standing up a new integrated police force? Well, surprise. Every issue they identified were precisely the same issues that the UN technical team had come with the first time. Uh, we, we assume certain things that people just can't figure it out for themselves. And, but, but since they themselves constructed their own agenda, and then broke out into working groups to begin to work on those issues and on those problems, it was there. It was wholly owned by them. And the police technical experts then played the role of resources in those working groups, and their contributions were invaluable and were deeply appreciated by the Burundians. A very different approach in terms of how you relate to your host country. So I would argue that we need to think more about issues of process, and how we approach people. I would also argue that is true not just in terms of the host country versus external intervener relationship, that is no less true in terms of donors uh, amongst each other, in terms of coordination of donors, in terms of the relationship between military and civilian, uh, in terms of the relationship between NGOs and, and the government, uh, the external interveners. If we could begin, instead of coming forward with our prescriptions about how to coordinate everything, rather involve people in a process where together they could begin, first of all, to establish some trust, establish, build some relationships, work at interest, what we call interest-based negotiations coming out of some of the work done at Harvard. Um, I think that we could make huge advances in the way we go about building uh, and, and, and getting to the point of all these reforms that everyone understands needs to be done. I think we know what needs to be done. The problem is the process. How do you get from point A to point B? Um, so finally, my, just in, my, I guess my final close, concluding points would be, first of all, I think we have to recognize that nothing is sustainable, absence a sense that it is indeed in the self-interest of the belligerent parties. And so everything we do should be centered upon how do we make that? I mean, how can we help build that uh, redefinition of self-interest? Uh, it also, nothing is works, I don't think, in this new paradigm that I'm talking about unless external interveners see their role less as prescribers or directors and far more as third-party facilitators. Uh, and third, that we need a country-centric approach to our, that doesn't, the country doesn't get lost as we begin to become so preoccupied with dealing with our own institutional issues. And finally, I think we need to give much more attention to the process, to the training, to the method by which we try to reach these goals and objectives that we've all identified. Again, to all of you, thank you so much for every, all that you've contributed and thank you. all of you for participating.